Okay. Uh, hey everyone. I'm uh, Philip. I'm a DevOps at Blueberry, uh, and uh, this is the third last talk of uh, of our uh, today's meetup. And uh, I'll be talking about uh, the both technologies, uh, the the serverless and the automation, the Terraform that the that the guys introduced you uh, in the previous talks. So uh, once again, what's what's this about? Uh, I'll be, to, I'll be talking about an application, uh, it's called uh, Echo. Uh, basically, what's, what's Echo? Uh, we've been working on, on this uh, mobile application with uh, police department, and uh, this was done for, for some non-profit organization. And uh, basically, uh, we're using it for, for uh, searching for lost children. So. Uh, what does it look like? Uh, this is the application. As, as you can see, it's, it's uh, fairly simple. Basically, uh, police provides us the, with uh, this uh, API through which we, we are downloading the data about, about the lost children. And we are simply uh, displaying them in, in, uh, in this app. And uh, furthermore, there, there, uh, there are some uh, attributes uh, about, about these children that we don't know uh, at this moment uh, what what uh, attributes are required. So basically, we know that uh, some children have some color of hair or some color of, of their eyes, but at, at this moment we don't really know the structure of the of the data that we are getting. So uh, the application needs to uh, needs to count on that, and. Uh, we as DevOps, uh, we were we were uh, given this task to create uh, an infrastructure, a backend, which which will serve uh, as a data layer for this application. So, uh, as you saw, because this is a very simple application, we thought that uh, this is this is the perfect uh, perfect opportunity for us to actually uh, fool around a little and uh, try new things, try new technologies for our stack. So we decided uh, that we can you know, over-engineer this a little bit. And uh, we imagined, what if we can create an infrastructure that would be automatically scalable, almost virtually unlimitedly, uh, that would be high available by design that would be uh, fairly cheap because we would like to pay for only the, the resources that we are using and you know secure out of the box, uh, full automated and uh, fully tested because we want to know that what we have delivered is actually working. So uh, we thought about that a little and uh, this is the scribble that, that we uh, came up with. This is an actual join I have upstairs on uh, on my drawing wall. So uh, we kind of had a plan. We had to uh, select all the all the necessary uh, technologies, and uh, this is what we have, what we have came up with. Basically, as I as I have stated, uh, it's a mobile application, and since uh, most of our developers are fluent in JavaScript, uh, we decided to use a React Native for, for this front end. So uh, the mobile application is based on the, on the React Native. The uh, handling of data, the data communication, is done through a GraphQL server. And uh, specifically, we are using an Apollo. So we have an Apollo server client stack here. Uh, furthermore, this was based on an expo, which is basically uh, a set of built tools to, to uh, get uh, real fast in the production with, with React Native. But later on, we, we have detached from that, so we had to create our own build pipelines. And this is why uh, we're introducing a fast end there, because that's, uh, one, once again, this is a set of tools to uh, build native applications. So uh, what about backend? Uh, in Blueberry, we are, we are heavily uh, dependent on Amazon Web Services because this is uh, the biggest cloud provider at this moment. And uh, as well, this, uh, this provider 
has the widest vari variety of, of all services they, they uh, provide. So uh, the core of the backend is based in AWS. Uh, the automation is done through Terraform, so this is what uh, Lucas was talking about previously. The uh, computational core of this platform is based on uh, Lambda functions, uh, so uh, I'll dive into that a little bit later. And the automation of delivery of all the changes that we are introducing in, in this platform uh, is handled by a Circle CI automation platform. Uh, this is uh, something similar like Jenkins or GitLab CI or, or something similar. Uh, the Docker in this context, uh, it, it, it doesn't uh, mean that we are using a run, uh, uh, that we are using it as a runtime, but uh, we are using it as our uh, built environment. So basically, uh, in, in this Docker, we have all the necessary stuff uh, in order to be able to build all the Lambda functions that we are using and in order to be able to deliver the changes into, into the infrastructure. So uh, we have our Terraform binaries there, uh, all the uh, testing uh, necessities, and so on and so on and so on. So, and uh, yeah, finally, I forgot uh, to mention InSpec. InSpec is an uh, automation and audit tool from Chef, and we're using it because uh, all of our server provisioning is heavily reliant on Chef uh, providers. So this is why we, why, why we have introduced an InSpec for, for testing this uh, infrastructure. So we had a plan, we had a set of uh, tools that we wanted to use, and we got to work. So this is what we, what we have came up with. This is a description, a, a diagram of uh, the AWS uh, infrastructure that, uh, that we currently use. So uh, to describe it, uh, to make it simple, uh, we have three data lands here. Uh, first one is basically how do we retrieve the data from uh, our backend into the into the application. So uh, that's that's the first one. The second one is how do we actually seed the database, seed the data layer that we that we have. So how do we connect to the to the API that that police provides us, and uh, how we, how do we down, download the data and and seed the database? So this is the second lane. The third lane is we need to be able to notify the user of the application that some data changed. So for example, if, if a new kit uh, gets missing, we need to be able to, to notify this user. So this is the third line. How do we react to the changes in, in, the, uh, in the database records? So as I have mentioned previously, this all is based in AWS. Uh, we have a React Native uh, application, and inside this application there's an um, Apple Cloud. So how do we actually connect to the backend uh, that's providing the Apple server? So, uh, for, for, you know, for, for the GraphQL, so how do we connect to that? So, to make it, uh, to give you a more broader perspective uh, about this infrastructure, this gray area represents a region. So uh, region is a location. You, you, you can imagine that uh, this location is a data center. It could be in Frankfurt, it could be uh, you know, in America, for example. It could be in any of the data centers that Amazon provides. So uh, in this example, when I'm talking about, about uh, this environment, for example, production, we have our production environment in Frankfurt because most of our users are from Europe. So to have the, the lowest latent, uh, network latencies, we need to be, uh, we, we have located this uh, infrastructure in Frankfurt. For the other environments that we have, I'll be, I'll be joking uh, 
in detail about them a little bit later. But uh, the staging and integration environment that we have are located in uh, America, in uh, North Virginia and Ohio. And this is because the, the biggest data centers are located in the US and therefore the prices are the lowest there. So uh, I don't really care about the, the network latencies there. So this is why we have uh, staging and integration located in America, but the production is located in Europe, once again, because most of our customers are located in Europe. So, this gray area is Frankfurt. Inside Frankfurt, we have a multiple availability zone. Availability zone is basically self-contained environment that has multiple redundancies on multiple levels. I mean, this is based on a, on a physical layer, like uh, you have redundant servers that are completely separated. On a network layer, you have a completely separated uh, network infrastructure and uh, application layer. So basically, this availability zone is completely self-contained. And in a case that one of these availability zones go, go down, the rest of them is able to take over and uh, cover for this loss. So once again, if any part of this infrastructure of these availability zones go down, the rest of them are able to, to uh, withstand the current load. So this is how you make the current infrastructure high available. So uh, going deeper into, into this infra, so uh, what's, what's inside these availability zones? As I was saying, we are using an um, Apollo server for, uh, for re relaying the data from the database to, to the end uh, device, which in this case is the mobile application. So how do we do it? First of all, uh, we have this Apollo server located in Lambda functions. So uh, about Lambda functions, Adam was talking about previously, so uh, I won't really, I won't really uh, repeat that. Uh, but uh, by default, if you want to access some of your resources in AWS, that Lambda functions need to uh, need to be uh, connected to your to your VPC to your virtual private networks. Uh, in order to do that, you actually have to create those networks, you have to create this kind of infrastructure to be able to connect to your resources. So uh, in our case, we want to uh, connect from our GraphQL Lambda to the, to the database layer, to the, to the DynamoDB. Uh, so how do we do it? Uh, how did we uh, do it? Uh, we have to create uh, multiple networks. One of these is a private network, which by default uh, can't connect to the internet, it, it's, it's uh, completely separated from, from the rest of the networks. And uh, as well, we have a public network. Public network, by default, is able to connect to the, to the internet gateway. So this is a way how we are able to connect to the internet from, uh, from, the, public, uh, from the public network. So, that GraphQL that's running an Apollo server there. Uh, by default, it, it can be accessed from the outside, from the internet. So uh, once again, Adam, Adam already was a little bit talking about this. We are leveraging an API gateway, which uh, in this case represents a um, REST single API endpoint to the which uh, the uh, React Native application is connected. So for our example, if we are talking about the production environment, the API gateway is running on this URL, production.echobackend.cz slash version one slash data. And if you access this endpoint, it will get rerouted to those Lambda functions that, that are running the Apple server. And in our case, the more requests you make to this API gateway, the more Lambda functions need to spin up to withhold the load that you are currently making. So this is uh, 
from the point of outer scaling. Basically, the more requests you are making, the more lambda functions get spin up inside this environment, and it will still be able to, to uh, serve the, the request that you are making. So, how do we actually connect from the GraphQL, from the, from the lambda function, to our data layer, which in this case is DynamoDB? Once again, Adam was talking about this a little bit uh, earlier. We are using uh, a DynamoDB for our da data layer because we don't know the structure of the data that, that we are getting. So this is why we are uh, using an object uh, database. So in our case, this is a DynamoDB. It's able to, to linearly scale. So uh, once again, the, the more lambda functions that we are spinning up, it, uh, the, the database layer is still able to, to uh, work uh, flawlessly, uh, no matter how many uh, lambda functions are connected to it. So uh, in a matter of auto scaling, uh, this is the perfect duo, the lambda function and the DynamoDB object database. So uh, once again, to summarize this, we have a React Native application which is connecting the uh, Apple client to this API backend uh, through the API gateway. Then it makes a uh, request, the lambda functions will spin up, and it, the, the request it is uh, getting rerouted to, to these lambda functions. And uh, these lambda functions, to actually serve you some data, uh, they are connecting to the DynamoDB and returning the data you were requesting. So, one optimization here. You can see that, uh, that the request is actually uh, routed through the VP endpoint. So what does this VP endpoint do? By default, uh, when you are requesting something, it, it really doesn't matter where, but uh, if the request is routed through the main router, so it kind of gets out of your current uh, AWS region, you will get built for it. And, and this, this, this is no little money. I mean, uh, in the matter of infrastructure, it could be high as, for example, 30% of, of your total bill. So the network uh, data transfers are not really, <laughs> not really that cheap as, as, as you would imagine. So uh, how do you optimize this? How, how do you actually avoid getting out of your region when you are requesting data. I mean the data from, for example, resources that are located in your re region as well. So in our example, this is DynamoDB. So uh, for this purpose, you, we are introducing a VPC endpoint, which is a service that basically creates a record inside your, uh, inside your routing tables, and then it gets resolved and it sees that you are requesting the local data, it will reroute them through the local routers to the DynamoDB. So you, don't, you, you aren't actually uh, going outside the region and all the data is flowing through your local networks. So you won't get built for that. So this is the reason we are, we are using the VPC endpoint. Okay, so the second layer, the, the second data layer. In this case, we're talking about how do we actually seed the database so we can provide the data uh, to, the, to the front end. So, as I have mentioned, the uh, police has, has provided us with SOAP API. And uh, the data that we are processing, uh, we don't really know the structure at, at, at this moment. So, by design, we have, we have created another Lambda function that serves uh, as kind of API worker. This is, uh, in this case, we are counting on that we will, in the future, have multiple backends. We will have uh, multiple sources of data. So uh, by design, you are able to create a multiple API workers with different uh, clients inside them. So they are able to process different, different uh, types of endpoints. So in uh, our current example, we have a API worker lambda functions that, uh, that have a SOAP client inside them. 
and they are requesting the data from the SOAP API. So, as I have mentioned, by default, those Lambda functions are not able to access the internet. So how do they do it? How, how does this function connect to the internet? Uh, it's fairly simple. At this, at this moment, you have two options. The first one would be to leverage the NAT gateway from, uh, from Amazon, which is out of the box service, um, that uh, you can set up in like, I don't know, five minutes, and, and it's just working. You, you're connecting through it to, to the internet. Uh, the downside of this solution is uh, that it's very pricey. I mean, when you have multiple environments, multiple availability zones, multiple networks, uh, this can get pricey real fast. So uh, one of the optimizations, once again, how, how do you send data on this, of, of, on, on the data transfers, uh, is to actually create your own net instances, network address translation. So uh, in this example, we have um, a server running inside the public network. Uh, it's a NAT instance, and we are rerouting all the requests to the internet through this NAT instance. So, for our example, when I have API worker, it's able to connect uh, through, through the local router to this net, net instance, and from this net instance, that requests are rerouted through the public router to the internet gateway to the internet to the actual SOAP API from the police. So, once again, to summarize this, we have some triggers inside the, the Amazon we are actually using a CloudWatch service to trigger in regular intervals this API worker that, uh, in, in our case, this is every five minutes. So every five minutes, this Lambda, functions, uh, this Lambda function will spin up. It will connect through that instance to the internet, it, and it will download the soap data back to the, uh, to the worker, and it will save them to the, dynam to the DynamoDB. So this is how we are populating the database. To uh, may, maybe a little side note, the, the CloudWatch is a monitoring service from Amazon. So this is a monitoring in kind of traditional way, like you know, grass, uh, logs, and so on and so on. Uh, a little bit later, I'll, I'll be talking about X-ray. So uh, so uh, I hope I, I won't forget about that. Okay, so. The third line. As I was mentioning, we need to be able to notify the users about the, the changes. And you have, you have multiple ways how, how you can handle this. The, I think the most cool one in, uh, in our use case is that we are, we are using something that's called DynamoDB Streams. And uh, what it does is that basically it, it, it will create another separate DynamoDB table, and it will monitor all your changes that, that, that you are making to, to your current data inside the DynamoDB. So when you alter or add something or remove a record, it will create an item inside the DynamoDB streams, uh, but basically mentioning what kind of change you've made and how did the data change. So how do we le leverage this? To process these changes, we have a third Lambda function inside our infrastructure that's called uh, DB event handler. And this Lambda function is pulling, once again, in regular intervals, uh, this table with all the record changes. And based on the type of change, it will trigger a um, push notification to the user. So once again, if uh, a new record appears here, that a new child was lost, it will get processed by this lambda, and based on that type of change, it will trigger the push notification through the Firebase service, and it will send uh, notifications both to, to the, uh, to the uh, iOS and Android application. So this is the last, this is the last data lane that, that we are using. Okay, to mention the rest of the services I have here, the S3. Uh, S3 is a simple storage service, and we are, we are uh, saving the 
Lambda source code there. So uh, this is how, how we are deploying the, the Lambda functions. Furthermore, uh, as I was talking about the monitoring, okay, the X-ray, the X-ray versus the CloudWatch. So I was saying the CloudWatch is, is more traditional monitoring tool like the overall performance for the infrastructure. You have, you have graphs and so on and so on. But the X-ray, X-ray is, uh, is very neat tool. Then you need to debug the uh, this complicated infrastructure. I mean, in a matter of, we are using multiple mi microservices here. And then you have a simple request. I mean, for example, for downloading data, it will get uh, through the multiple services. Like for example, the API gateway, it will get rewritten you know, multiple times. It will get to the to the GraphQL, and then it will get rewritten one more time. And uh, you know, it, it, it's accessing the Dynamo DB, it's generating some things. And this is very complicated infrastructure. I mean, so when it stops working, when uh, when, when it uh, stops serving your data, how do how do you actually debug this? How how, how do you actually know what's happening where, where the problem lies? So this is then uh, where the uh, extra comes in. This is. Uh, monitoring tool for microservices. So we are sending here uh, notifications about the request, about the, the, uh, all, and all the points it, it, it's uh, getting passed through. So uh, this is very neat. I, I, I won't go into the detail about, about this, uh, this uh, service, but you should definitely see it if, if you're uh, having trouble with, uh, you know, debugging this kind of infrastructure. Okay, so uh, continuing to the, uh, yeah, to the DNS management. When we are spinning up uh, these environments, we actually, for, for, for example, the API gateway, it, by default it will have the URL generated by Amazon. So this is something not really, you know, this is not easily remembered. Uh, you can't easily remember it. So this is why we're using uh, Route 53 uh, service to actually generate our subdomains for us and, and register them. And furthermore, we are using an ACM uh, which will generate automatically the SSL certificates for, for this endpoint. So we are able to on the fly generate uh, our URL friendly remember rememberable URL of this API and uh, generate the SSL certificates for uh, dynamically. So this is handled by DNS ACM and, uh, and by Terraform. Uh, the one last thing I want to mention. At this point, the API would be accessible for, every, for, for anyone from, from from uh, you know all over the internet, so uh, this is not a best practice. I mean, uh, in the matter of security, you don't really want to have an open API to the internet if it's not really necessary. So how how, how do you actually secure this? So uh, we are using the Cognito Identity Pool, which is service from Amazon, to secure this kind of in, uh, the, this kind of API. And uh, how it actually works is that basically we have a guest user, we have an anonymous uh, user that uh, you can that you can use to authenticate. So basically, when the application is starting up, it will make a request to this to this Cognito Identity Pool, and the Cognito Identity Pool will generate you uh, temporarily uh, some credentials to access. Uh, parts of the infrastructure, uh, and these credentials are temporary. You can you can make it, uh, let's say, per hour or, or uh, per day or per week, month. It really depends on you. But they are temporary. So uh, once again, when the application starts, uh, it will make a request to Cognito Identity Pool, which will generate you through the STS some temporary uh, temporary credentials. And it will use those credentials to encrypt the request that it's making to the API gateway. So it's the requests are authenticated and encrypted as well at the same time. 
So the possible attacker won't receive the real data that's, that's uh, flying through uh, the pipeline. So this is basically all the infrastructure that, that we have at, at this point. And all, uh, everything that, that you see on this picture is handled by Terraform. So uh, we are able to spin up multiple environments in a matter of minutes. This actually takes the maximum amount of, of 10 minutes, and uh, we are able to, to spin them on demand as, as, as we want to. So uh, one more thing I wanted to talk about is the development environments. I mean, this happened to almost everyone. You have developers that are developing against something that's not really a production environment. And when you deploy your changes to the, to the application, it might break down because, uh, because, it's the, because the production environment differs from the, from the staging one and from the, the development one that, that the developers were using. So uh, if I go back, you can see that, uh, you can see that uh, we have, at this moment, we have it duplicated. We have three environments. We have the production, we have staging, and we have integration, which are completely the same. I mean, like 100%. Uh, uh, OK, almost 100%, because, uh, for example, when we have uh, Lambda functions or DynamoDB scaling, we don't really need to scale uh, this much for the staging environment. So these are the only differences that, that, uh, that there are between the staging and the, and the production environment. But uh, other than that, all three environments are completely identical. So uh, this is how you avoid actually all these problems that, uh, that you can stumble upon. OK, so now it's time to, to show you the code of this app. I won't be really going through, you know, through the through the whole code base because I, I don't really see the point. But uh, I will show you the uh, overall folder structure. I will show you some uh, some necessities that we have, that we were using, and the most important thing about that our built environment and all the automation that we have in place to, uh, you know, make this uh, kind of continuous uh, integration. Uh, approach. So, okay. So uh, let me switch to my to my editor. Okay. So, as you can see, uh, the whole project at this moment is a big monorepo. I mean, not not, not the whole project, just just the backend. But we have both. Lambda functions and the Terraform code in the same repository. Why do we do this? Uh, basically, it's very simple. Uh, I think this is a very simple concept. This is a, a small application, so we don't really need to separate all these all these parts of uh, of uh, the infra. Uh, when you have uh, multiple microservices, like let's say more than five or more than six. It will get more complicated, so maybe that's the point. I think that, that it's better for you if you separate it. But for us, we have just three Lambda functions and some Terraform code. So this is why we have, we have a big model repo here. Uh, so in a matter of, uh, of Lambda functions, I, I will go very briefly uh, through this. Uh, the design is very simple. We have a folder for each uh, Lambda function, uh, whereas um, Entry point, which is index.js, it's it's written in Node. So for for our example here, uh, this is a GraphQL Lambda function. You can see that we are running a Apollo server here, and it's it's very very simple design. What we need to uh, be able to do is we just need to create a Lambda uh, archive. In this case, lam Lambda zip, which will contain all the necessary dependencies, all the source code. Everything you need in order to be able to start up this Lambda function. So uh, once again, in this case, this would be Node modules, all the packages it needs, 
all the source code, all bundled uh, into the, this, this uh, zip file. And this zip file we are able to deploy to the, uh, to the Amazon. Okay, so in regards with Terraform, at this point, you really need to decide how do you structure your source code, how do you layer all the different uh, parts of infrastructure, and how do you separate your environments. From the highest perspective, uh, you can separate those in a matter of create and multiple AWS uh, accounts. I mean for each environment. So basically, if you have three environments like staging, integration, production, you just create three uh, completely separated accounts, so they will be all completely identical. In our case, once again, this is a very sim simple and small application. This is just a proof of concept. And we didn't really want to, to uh, overcomplicate things, so we are using just one Amazon account and we are separating all the uh, environments on a region level. So this is why I was saying that uh, since we have free environments and uh, our staging and integration are running in America, so this is exactly what I'm talking about. This is separated uh, on a level of region location. So once again, we have completely identical environments, but they are located in different data centers inside one Amazon account. If you have some more complicated project, uh, I just repeat it. You should, you should really separate it on a level of AWS account. If you want to create some environments dynamically, for example, you know, like uh, f feature environments, uh, this would get a little bit more complicated, but still you should be able to do it like under one organization to create dynamically uh, more accounts for you, or you can do it like like we do it, so we can create a feature feature environments based on the regions. So, how did we actually separate uh, the code? So at this moment, if you want to automate things, if you want to use Terraform, uh, and if you have a team of you know multiple DevOps uh, working on this, you want to definitely be able to to share the code to share the the uh, development process of those features. So how do you do this? Uh, we are using a remote state for that. This is what uh, Lukas was talking about previously. But at this point, if, if you have no infrastructure, how do you actually save that state to the, to the remote? Because you have no infra where you don't have any S3 buckets. And uh, this is like a chicken egg problem. So uh, how do you do this? So this is when we are introducing a bootstrap layer. The bootstrap layer serves the only purpose and it, it should prepare the, uh, the environment for you to use the Terraform to automate this. So in bootstrap layer, we are creating just an S3 bucket for, for later on where, where we'll be storing the remote state of other layers of, of the rest of the infrastructure. And we are using uh, DynamoDB uh, to actually lock uh, the, the, the changes of the infrastructure. So this is working uh, like uh, in, in a way that when you are running some Terraform code, it will create a record inside this database. It will create something. We, we, we can call it a lock. And uh, if you run something in parallel, it will wait until this lock is kind of unlocked. So um, once again, this bootstrap layer should serve just the only purpose of preparing the infrastructure for you. Some of other additional things that you can, that you can create here are, for example, some, some uh, basic security. Uh, I mean like turning on security logs creating a root access credentials or something like that. So um, this is all, all about the bootstrap layer. Yeah, and one more thing. When you are running this bootstrap layer, the state of the Terraform is actually committed to as, as part of a source, uh, source code. So this is shared on a level 
of a repository. And if you have any secrets inside there, you should definitely encrypt it. So you commit it in your repository as encrypted so no one can, can exploit that. Okay, moving on. The next layer is a global layer. I mean, at least we call it that, uh, like this. In a global layer, uh, we are using, well, we are creating all the resources that are shared across all the uh, environments. So, in this example, in, in our applications, uh, those could be like uh, DNS credentials, like uh, registering the, the domain. It could be IAM users, I mean uh, the, the developers, the uh, DevOps team, and so on and so on, the user account, and other stuff like uh, security policies, like uh, IAM roles, and so on and so on. So these are all the things that are shared across the environment, not really something specific. The last layer here is called environment. So this is the most important part. This is all the, this is the core of the backend service. This includes all the necessary stuff in order to be able to actually serve the request that you are making to that, uh, to that backend. So in our case, this consists of things like API, Gateway, uh, Cognito, you know, uh, the Lambdas, the DynamoDB provisioning, and so on and so on. These are all the things that I was showing you on, on the diagram. Okay, so for example, if, if I'll show you the API gateway, as, as I was saying, I, I won't really go through, through the code here, but you can see that it's, it's very fairly simple design. You have your blocks uh, of code. Each block is creating some resources for you and you are connecting them together and creating you know, something awesome. So, uh, so this is a way how, how you can, for example, create an API gateway. Okay, so moving on, I wanted to show you the environments that we are using to, to build this, to build this uh, infrastructure. So I'm, uh, I'm usually using a make file to, to simplify things for me to, you know, wrap uh, some shell commands. So uh, once again, we are using a Docker image. This Docker image uh, contains all the necessary stuff to deliver our changes to the infrastructure. So uh, in our case, uh, maybe I'll, I'll show you I'll show you from my command line. So uh, I'm, I'm inside my my repository. So I'll just spin up that Docker environment. Uh, in my case, uh, this will download you know our our image from from the from the ECR that we are using. It will mount the uh, source code a folder to this to this image, and the most interesting part is here. To make this secure, um, I'm actually uh, I'm actually uh, using my own credentials for for AWS, and I'm in injecting them inside this container. So so I don't really need to store any uh, of my secrets inside that container and any any uh, member of my team, of our DevOps team, is able to download this container and uh, use his own credentials to actually alter this, uh, this infrastructure, this environment. So this is how you share the build, the build uh, tools across your team. So I'm, uh, I'm inside my container, so I'll just change there to to, for example, uh, the environments layer. Um, I'm developing some features here, and uh, when I'm, you know, when I'm, uh, when I'm able to uh, to test this, I just run a make build, which in this case will just run Terraform apply, and it will it will automatically approve them, so it, it won't really wait for you. Uh, to see what changes it's making, and it will automatically apply them. Uh, so you can see this is this is running my Terraform code against 
my current environment. Yeah, I just realized I should talk a little about uh, a little bit about environments. So uh, yeah, to to take a step back. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, sh I should take a step back here. Uh, yeah, I was talking about that we are creating identical environments. Once again, uh, in our case, it's staging, integration, and production. So, uh, how do we actually create identical infrastructures across different regions? Because we have just one source code. How, how do we share the source code across our environment? And this is where Terraform workspaces come in. Basically, a workspace in the context of Terraform means you have a flag uh, that, uh, that uh, specifies on which workflow uh, you, uh, I mean workspace, on which workspace you're currently on. So basically, you can switch between them. Uh, you just run something like Terraform, Workspace, Select, and Staging, Integration, Production. You can create how many of these you want. Uh, it doesn't really matter. But what's, what's the important part here is that uh, inside your source code, you are able to access what kind of workspace you're currently using. So if I switch to my, uh, to my provider here, once again, provider is something that, specify, uh, that will specify against what environment, what, inf what, uh, what provider you are making these changes against. So in our case, this is uh, AWS. And I am actually, uh, I am actually uh, using the Terraform workspace uh, inside my code to switch between the regions that we are using, uh, that, that we are creating the infrastructure in. So for example, as you can see, I have a um, global variables module here in which I'm storing, uh, sorry, in which I'm storing the configurations about the regions that, I, that I'm currently using. So if I'm on a staging workspace, it will map us uh, to use the US East one uh, for our region. Uh, if I'm on uh, integration, it will uh, use the US East two. And in my, it, if I'm in production, it will use the U, U central one. So going back, you can see that dynamically when I'm switching between the Terraform workspaces, it will, in the background, switch the region that I'm delivering these changes to. So uh, the workflow is usually like uh, when I'm developing some new feature, I'm developing it against the staging environment. So uh, for my local uh, deliveries, I am not really switching the workspaces. But when we are delivering the changes to the in integration and production, which is a part of the automation run in Circle CI, and I'll be talking about that just in, in five minutes. Going back to my make file, I'm usually running the make build, which will, which will involve the apply and inspect command. The apply is very straightforward. Once again, I was saying that uh, it will just run the Terraform apply with auto approve, which means that it will, it will make all the necessary steps in order to, to meet your demands, to, to meet uh, all the things that you have changed inside the Terraform. But the most important or more important uh, part here is the inspect command. And as I was, as I was saying, the inspect is uh, it's a testing tool. We are using it to actually check that all the things that we have created inside the Amazon are working as we expect. So we are writing integration tests in this, in, in, uh, in inspect uh, framework. So what does it do? Basically, when, when we are running inspect, it consists of two parts. It will involve the inspect AWS and inspect local. Uh, the difference here is we have multiple providers. I have an Amazon provider, which will create you know, some, some resources in Amazon, but I have a local provider, which, for example, can uh, build and pack my Lambda functions and upload them to S3, for example. So in this matter, in this sense, we have two uh, 
separate uh, test suits for each layer. So this layer is located, or not this layer, but these test suits are located in a test folder. And you can see we have some tests for, for AWS and for local. So for AWS, for example, if I'm, uh, if I'm talking about the API gateway, I'm checking that we have some, some uh, roles in place, we have some policies in place. Uh, as well for, for Lambda functions, for example, so I'm checking that my uh, bucket in which I store the, the Lambda zips are in place, it has correct uh, security policies, and so on and so on. Uh, from the other perspective, uh, in here, from the local, from, from my machine or from CI, I am running a test suite against that infrastructure. So for example, here I am, I am uh, running a simple curl against my API to check if it's working. If, uh, if in this case, if I'm not authent uh, authenticated, if it will return me the access denied message, for example. So uh, if, I, if I am authenticated, I'm expecting uh, to, to get back some, some payload, and so and so on. I'm actually checking that the whole infrastructure is working end to end. And at this moment, we have around, I don't know, maybe 230 tests for, uh, for integration tests for the whole backend. So when I'm delivering some new change, I can actually see I, I, if I have broken something or, or not. I've shown you how, how we are testing uh, from uh, the local machine and we are testing against the AWS. Once again, we are using Inspect for that. Inspect has some resources that it can basically access the uh, Amazon through their APIs and check if those resources are, are actually in place and configured in a way that we are expecting. So, uh, regarding the testing, yeah. Regarding the testing, one more thing. Uh, let me just go back to my make file. Perfect. Okay, so uh, I was talking about the Terraform and Inspect, but uh, how do you actually connect these two things together? Because you know the, the Inspect is a universal tool for testing AWS services. So uh, how do you actually connect the Terraform and Inspect together? So this is uh, where I'm using a little hackity hack uh, I'm actually generating all the necessary variables that that, uh, that I need to have in my in my test suit uh, through the Terraform output. So basically, when I'm creating an API through Terraform in AWS, I need to know the URL of this API that, that was just created, and I don't want to actually manually search for it and and alter my tests. So to automate this, I'm using the Terraform output. Uh, which will actually take all those necessary variables that I need. It will put them inside the JSON and it will export them as a static file to my uh, to some location inside my inside my test suite. So uh, in this case, I'm, I'm I'm saving this data to the output variables, the JSON. And when I'm invoking the test, so uh, if I go back to to one of our test suite. So for example, yeah, to this backend. You can see that I'm actually uh, using this JSON, I'm parsing it inside my, my test file. Uh, by the way, uh, the inspect is written in Ruby, so all these tests have a Ruby syntax. So, uh, so uh, I am parsing this output variables, the JSON with all the Terraform variables. And I'm using those, those variables inside my test. So uh, when I was saying that I'm, I'm uh, making a curl request against this API, um, getting that API URL from those outputs that Terraform just, uh, just handed me. OK, so uh, I think this is, uh, this is uh, all about uh, the test part. I'll be going back to. Yeah, you can you can actually see this. This is the output of all our tests run against the uh, environments layer. So you can see that we are checking, you know, uh, everything through the S3 buckets, 
through the policies for DynamoDB, for the roles, uh, security groups for our users, you know, Lambda function roles, and so and so on. We are, we are, yeah, I saw here some networking stuff as well. So we are using uh, all these tools to check that uh, what we have just created is, is, uh, is working fine. So going back, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll switch back to my, to my presentation. So regarding the, the uh, delivery pipeline of our, of our changes, once again, we are using a Circle CI to automate all this stuff. So uh, then uh, to, to summarize this, when we are developing a new feature, I usually create a feature branch, you know, a, a standard uh, Git, uh, Git approach. I create a feature branch. I am developing there, uh, you know, my feature against the staging environment. At this point, if someone else from the team would be working on something similar or, or on some feature, on some bigger feature, uh, the easiest approach here would be to actually create his own environment, for example, in France, because that region we are not using at this moment. So for example, in France, he would be developing against his own infrastructure for a few hours, for a day, for a few days. Uh, when he will finish it, uh, he'll just destroy the, the, his environment and uh, he will create a pull request. That pull request uh, gets, you know, code review and so and so on. And if we are fine with that, uh, we will merge it into, into uh, the master branch. Everything that's inside master branch, it will trigger our pipelines here and it will it will get delivered to our integration environment. And these are the steps that will be taken every time some uh, pull request or something uh, gets merged in, in, into the master branch. So these steps, uh, basically we are starting with, uh, with our linter here. So uh, as part of this step, we are downloading the Docker image that I was, uh, that I was talking about. This is the exact image that we are using to develop it, uh, to, to uh, you know, to develop from our local machines. So we are like 100% certain that it will work here as well in a way we are expecting. So we are downloading this image. Uh, then we are, you know, checking the latest code inside this image. We are uh, authenticating us against the, uh, the Amazon uh, APIs using the deployer credentials so uh, we are able to, you know, execute all the necessary steps and create all the necessary infrastructure inside it. The next step is to actually initialize the Terraform. So we are downloading some, uh, some the, the latest plugins and all the necessary stuff for, uh, in order to, for, for Terraform to work. And uh, the next step is basically to do the same thing for environments layer. But the most important part here, as uh, you know, the, the winter step, we are actually uh, cycling through the, the, the folder structure and I'm looking for all the Terraform files here and I'm running a static validation against them. So I'm able uh, to tell if like all the inputs and outputs are, are correct and fine and all, all the syntax uh, part of the Terraform is working. The next step is to actually run a format which will tell me if everything is, if uh, this is about our code style, so basically uh, this uh, step will tell me if we are, uh, you know, uh, if we are doing, uh, if our code style is according to the best practices from Terraform. Okay, so this is regarding the, the linter step. If I go back, the next step, if uh, you know the linter passes, is to deploy the global layer. So once again, these few first few steps are the same. We are downloading the the image, we are uh, initializing the Terraform, and so on and so on. And here we are running a Terraform plan, which will generate the, the file with all necessary changes that the Terraform 
will make in order to mean to meet our you know new changes that we are introducing to the to the infrastructure. Uh, if the plan uh, goes uh, uh, flawlessly, in our case at this moment uh, for for this deployment, no new change is introduced for the global layer. Uh, so as far as it uh, it will trigger the next step, which is Terraform apply, which will take the plan that we just calculated and it, it will execute it. And we are uh, separating this to two steps so we can actually see what was happening later on if, if we need to, if, if something uh, didn't went according to plan. And the last step, of course, is to run our integration tests. So you can see that uh, for the global layer, we are running a different uh, test suite than for our environment layer. Okay, so if a global layer gets deployed, the next step is to deploy it to our integration environment. Once again, these steps are very similar. The only difference here is that we are uh, building our Lambda function, so basically these steps before we execute the Terraform itself, we are just regenerating the latest Lambda functions changes that we made. So, so we are regenerated, uh, we, we are regenerating the Lambda functions and deploying them to S3. Then, once again, the Terraform will make a plan. We apply this plan, and then we are running the integration tests against this layer. Okay. So if everything passes, the next step is at this point, the, the pipeline will stop and it will wait for us uh, with an approval request. And if we approve this request, which basically means that I just click here and click OK, it will continue to deploy these changes to the production. So from one point, it will require you to actually confirm that it should deploy all these changes to the production, but this is just a step uh, for us to make sure that someone is there to actually react if something did not went well at this point. Okay, so I think this is all regarding the, the deployment and uh, this is uh, this is uh, the finish of my of my presentation. So thank you all.